morning to you all once again, and thank you very much for joining this fish farming business webinar. My name is Rollings, and I am with Agribusiness Media, the largest digital free platform that's targeting farmers. We are the publishers of the popular Agribusiness Magazine, which is a monthly free publication, and the Agribusiness Directory, which is an annual free digital publication whose forward was done by Dr. Basera. And our third wing is Agribusiness Talk, which is responsible for our social media platforms. And lastly, this online agribusiness television hosting weekly webinars. So we will share links to our social media handles in the chat section later on. So if you are looking for information on the business of fish farming, you are in the right place. We welcome you. We are also going live on our Facebook page, which is Agribusiness Media. The reason why we are doing this webinar is to demystify fish farming and also to give specialists from different organizations a platform to share their experience, both business and technical information, and also the good management practices that will help in the migration from subsistence to commercial farming to ensure that you are doing it right. So the webinar is made possible by Agribusiness Online TV. So we'll also share a link to our YouTube channel where we upload our recorded webinars weekly in the chat section also later on and be sure to subscribe. So how the webinar is going to unfold is we're going to have an informative discussion with the great presentations from experts in the industry. And we will give farmers and participants that are joining a chance to ask questions. And this has been built in this program. So if you have any question, please type in the chat section and we'll have excellent experts to attend to your questions later on. And this is to allow a smooth transition between the presenters. And also note that we are finishing by 12 p.m. latest. So fish farming is a big business as you are going to learn today. And today, the total world fish production, the statistics that we have from 2016 is that it reached in all time 171 million tons worldwide of which 88% was for direct human consumption. So this production resulted in a record high per capita consumption of 20.3 kgs. That's in 2016, and the figures should have uh, gone up by now. OK, so we have the following presenter uh, presenters today. We have uh, Victor, he's with Lake Harvest. We also have Masrita, she's with Aquafeeds. And also Mr. Caetano is with the Zimbabwe Fish Producers Association. So without wasting time, may I invite the presenters to introduce themselves in that order, please. Good, thanks. Uh, good morning to farmers. Good morning to you. Uh, I'm Victor Chimene, Retail Operations Manager for Lake Harvest. Um, I will be presenting on fish um, economics, basically general calculation of uh, our gross profit margin and also um, uh, demystify the issues to do with the marketing of the fish. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mr. Sokonia Kaitano, and I'm an, an executive council member with the Zimbabwe Fish Pools Association. And I'm from a company called Blue Chip Fishers International as consultants of the industry. And I'm here to present to you a bit on the production models and uh, on the pond management issues. Thank you. Okay, so no doubt that we uh, have experts today. So let's go straight into our presentations. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think, uh, we, as I say, that I'm going to tackle on the issue of uh, production models. 
uh, as of late, uh, we have been big play. We have been having some big players in the industry, uh, like Lake Vest, and uh, they have been here since 1998. But as of now, currently, we have now seen that more players in the SME uh, scale have now come in to join the industry as key players. So I'm going to share uh, a bit about uh, the production models. Uh, the reason why I'm trying to share on this is because you are, we understand that for every business to be successful and profitable, you need to have the kind of model which is friendly and conducive to the kind of business that you are doing. As we understand that the success and profitability of fish farming depends on the production model used. If you fail to choose the right production model, depending to what you have, you can maybe think that fish farming is not profitable. So what is very important is to understand which model should I use, which model should I choose, and why should I choose those models. Choosing a certain production model is there to, we do it only to increase harvest yield. As you understand that, fish biological carrying capacity is exceeded by the intensive type of activity that we do in fish farming. So a model is now there to help us manage the intensity of our production so that we can realize good profit. So here I want to talk about the, the profitability and the success of a business model. The objective here is to make fish farmers understand which production models are best and suitable for their area and for their land and for what they have. And for them to appreciate the different kinds of production models, as well evaluating self-knowledge if they understand the production model needed for the extensive farmers, production models needed for the semi-intensive farmers, and production models needed for intensive production, intensive farmers. And then later, be able to apply this knowledge in starting their own fish farming business. Uh, to begin with, before I touch into different kinds of production models, we need to understand that fish lives in an environment. And in that environment is water. That's where all its life is. So whenever you are going into fish farming, remember that fish lives or depends on an environment, which is water. And in water, that's where it receives or it gets the supply of food and oxygen. It eats in water, it breathes in water. If it is out of water, fish cannot feed. Fish cannot breathe, so it has to live in water. In the same water, that's where the removal of meta metabolic waste, like ammonia, carbon dioxide, feces, etc., happens. If fish are not in water, all this removal will not happen. And it's in water where the maintenance of conditions like temperature, pH, and salinity also occurs. Why this? This is done for its growth, for its survival, and for reproduction. So if you want your fish to grow, it has to be in water. If you want your fish to survive, it has to be in water or reproduce, it has to be in water. 
So the environment which is water is key in fish farming. Hence, the reason why we need now to come out with models which are possible. I'm talking of the, one talk of the factors influencing production models. You cannot uh, decide any model, but you only decide a model depending on the land. That is, if you are doing fish farming on the land, do you have the land? Do you have the water body? Do you have the source of water? On because without water, there is no fish farming. You need to understand the type of production value chain that you want to embark on. Are you going on a hatchery? Are you going on a pond? Are you going on a cage or whatever, or a tank? So you need to understand. You need also to understand about the security issues before you decide a model. Affordability, because different models cost differently. Can you afford this model or you cannot afford? And you need to understand your intended production capacity. That will also influence the kind of model you are going to choose. And if there is market as well, like what uh, uh, my colleague Victor is going to talk. Types of production models. In fish farming, we've got floating cages, which can be placed in large water bodies like dams, lakes or oceans. We've got fish ponds, which can be on the land, either on a greenhouse or no greenhouse. We have got fish tanks, which are either in concrete form or plastic tanks. This can be on land, either also in greenhouse or not in greenhouse, depending on how you want to do it. It varies. We've got a model called recirculation aquaculture system, which is RAS. That also happens in, on land in a greenhouse and they've got a model called raceways and a model called harper systems. All these are the type of models that a fish farm can decide to use when he thinks him back into fish farming. You can look at these are different types of floating cages. I'm not going to spend time on now, I want to talk of uh, an intensive large circular cage. I think you can see on the screen that big, very large circular cage placed right on a vast expanse of water. It means that water body is very big. That big, large cage needs a large water body requires depth of over 20 meters. You cannot put that big large uh, cage where the depth are less 20 meters. The reason of the stocking densities. The operation required for that large big cage is on machinery. When you want to harvest, when you want to do other operation activities, make sure you have got the, machine, the right for machines that is needed to be used on that. Divers also are a key in such an operation of a model. But the stocking densities of that large circular model cage is between 32 cages to 42 kgs per cubic meter. You can imagine, this is huge. 
And if that model is 1,800 cubic meter, and uh, you are producing about 32 kgs per cubic meter to 42 kgs per cubic meter, it's massive production. And this kind of model is strictly compound feeds. You cannot use green water in such a model, but strictly compound feeds. But the advantage is on the natural water exchange and aeration cannot employ any pumping facilities there or any aeration facilities there on both the, of the amount of water where the cage is placed on. So that's one of the intensive large circular cage model. Then we have the semi-intensive rectangular and square cages where most of our SMEs are choosing. This can also be placed on large and small water bodies, depending the varies. From the lowest water body depth of five meters and above. So on five meters, you can place such type of cage depending to the model chosen. The experts will advise them. And operation on such type of cages is manual. There's no need to use machines, but manual. And divers may not be necessary because much of the work that divers does can be done by the attendants right on the operation. The stock intensities can be between 25 kgs to 32 kgs per cubic meter. That is on this type of model. And it's strictly compound feeds. Why? It's because it's on open waters. It's different uh, like farming in ponds. The advantage is on the natural water exchange and aeration. Also, you don't need to employ aerators or pumps to pump water in and out. That's one of the advantages. The, we're having another type of a model for the subsistence farmers. You can also put them either in a large water body or in a small water body. What is very important is the flotation. But if you look to it, is the type and the quality of the material used is not as those ones. So the operation here is manual and the lowest depth that you can put this type of a model is three meters. So if you put a water body, which is three meters and above, using such an extensive or a subsistence uh, type of a model, it's applicable. The stock densities are between 10 kgs to 20 kgs per cubic meter, only because you are using this on open waters and also strictly compound feeds. And the advantages are on natural water exchange and aeration. So no pumping in of water, no mitigation of oxygen by aerators or blowers. So these models are on floating cages. So on floating cages, you put them on open waters and the, the production system is different from what you do to the ponds or to the, to the tanks. The cost here is only on the capex. After the capex, we don't, there's no cost on the pumps, there's no cost on the aerators. You now have your cost on the operations. Here, you can look the ponds. These are some of the pond types. And uh, we want to understand 
the Pons model. You would find that extensive fish ponds have no, extensive farming fish ponds have no water exchange systems. And the stocking densities are between 0 0.8 kg to 2 kg per square meter area. There are people, there are people who doesn't want to farm fish to sell or for commercial reasons, but just for nutrition. And uh, they can go on this extensive fish pond and they don't worry much about the uh, water exchanges and whatever. What they need is to minimize the stock intensities. The same intensive fish ponds have water exchange systems and stock intensities between 2.5 kg to 4 kg per square meter area. And the intensive fish ponds have full capacity of water exchange as well aeration systems and stock intensities are between 5 kg to 10 kg per square meter area. And on fish ponds model, you can feed either by both compound feeds or green water. And uh, on this now, you need to understand the specifications when constructing these fish ponds. On both, you cannot design a model without understanding uh, how to design, how to construct, what the depth is like. So the depth, the depth at of the deeper end of a fish pond is between 1.2 meter to 1.5 meter. That is the depth of the water level. And the depth of the shallow end is between 0 0.5 meter to 0 0.75 meters water level. And they really need to leave a free board, maybe of 20 to 30 centimeters. And when constructing these fish ponds, remember that they must have some dikes and the dikes must not be too narrow. And those dikes must be between 1.5 meters to three meters. These are much of the models that a lot of uh, our SMEs are choosing. The reason you can use water from the bowls, you can pump water from the rivers or from the dam on this model. So even though we, you don't have a dam, a big water body, you can still do fish farming if you manage to have your bowl or your well. Then you choose the size of the model you want to use. We also have the model, which is the recirculation aquaculture system model. This is too intensive and this can happen on land and the most of the times in greenhouses. So you can do this any time of the season, there will be production, but it's so intensive. The system of cleaning water, the system of biofilting, the system of aeration, and whatever must be there each and every time. You cannot afford to run even a second without the system running perfectly. On course, you'll be stocking quite a lot of fish. But the advantage of this model is the reduced water requirement, reduced land against the high stock intensities. Per hectare, you could produce around a thousand metric tons using this model of a system. Such selection is very flexible. Only you just choose any land you want and you do your construction. And then reduce the waste water affluent volume because of the systems. And then there is an increased biocyclity and easy disease treatment then there is an ability to closely monitor and control of environmental conditions. But feeding is strictly compound feeds. So that's another kind of 
fish farming model that one can do depending if he can afford. We have got a model which is a harper system where you can place some harper nets in a water body. Usually the water body must not be so deep on both if we, you don't use some uh, floating uh, materials there. You just use some pegs. So you need to use a water body which is not very deep, possibly around two meters and below. It's very possible. And uh, when doing the harpers, make sure you also need an aerator so that you continue mitigating uh, the oxygen levels. The harpers doesn't have some bigger holes, they have small holes. So we need to encourage the water exchange in and out of the harpers so that the fish, our fish can get enough oxygen. And uh, you can put these harpers either in a large water body, but at the shallow areas. And on that, you don't need even the waste outlet pipe to be inserted. But when you put the harpers on a large uh, pond, you need that pond to have uh, the water outlet waste pipe as well the inlet uh, uh, water pipes so that you continue pumping in the water plus the aeration system. And uh, an aerator is uh, quite uh, essential on this model of fish farming. And uh, this upper system is usually used on nesting production facilities. It's difficult to grow fish to table size using uppers only because of the size of the netting that you use. At the same time, the depth levels of the water body, as well that you are using the pegs to make your upper intact. It's not floating. So you don't want you to lose fish there. And uh, feeding is both compound feeding and green water on both. It's like in a pot. So it's one of the models that uh, uh, we can use as fish farmers. So choosing a model depends to you. And you can choose depend if you've got the land, if you've got the water body, if you've got the source of water, if you, uh, you can afford and they understand the uh, production capacity you want, and if you've got the market and the security. So thanks very much for this little presentation on the fish farming production models. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that great presentation. And just a reminder to the participants and farmers that if you have any question for Mr. Caetano, please post in the chat section then you will be able to attend to, to your questions later on. Thank you very much, Mr. Caetano, for that great presentation. Then we, our next presenter is Majita from Aquafeeds. My name is Majita Mufukare from Aquafeeds. And I am going to be tackling uh, feeds in fish farming. Um, availability of fish feeds in the country, um, our range of, um, of fish feeds, and also in particular how fish feeds are made and how the entire process feeds in into the success of the farmer. Um, so I am going to begin my presentation by just going through the process of fish feed manufacturing. So I thought this was important so that farmers understand what goes through until we have the pellets that are fed to the fish throughout the whole process. So the process of manufacturing fish feed starts with formulation. Now formulation is key because fish at different stages of their lives require different nutritional levels. 
So the formulations are done according to the requirements of the fish at that stage in its life. Um, this formulation will put together the ingredients. Um, uh, the main ingredients are the maize, the soyas, the sources of protein, uh, the vitamins and the minerals. So these are put together in the requirements that are required by the fish at that particular stage in its life. Once these are mixed, they are then milled. So again, milling is a very important stage because you have your soya and your maize, uh, but they need to be broken down into very small particles so that they mix properly. If the milling is, done, is not done appropriately, it means that the fish will be eating maybe just maize on its own without the other components of the feed. So all the ingredients have to be milled very finely and also milling will allow for the next stage which is extrusion. So extrusion is cooking under high heat and high pressure, but this is done only for a short period of time so that the nutrients do not disintegrate. But the cooking allows for the unlocking of, um, of for example, if it's maize, it allows for the unlocking of the carbohydrates in the maize so that they are available for the fish to be able to digest completely. So like I said, extrusion happens under high heat and high pressure. So um, steam is used in this process, which makes the feed moist. So once the feed is moist, it needs to be dried so that some of the moisture is taken out and the feed can be stored. Uh, shelf life of fish feed is about six months. So for the feed to be able to be stored for the six months period, it has to be dried until it has a moisture content of 12% or less. So after extrusion, the feed is dried and then it is baked off and, and dispatched. So each of these stages is important because it, it makes a fish feed that is number one. It has ingredients that are available for the fish to digest. And also number two, it reduces waste in that once the feed is cooked, and it becomes available for the fish to digest, the fish is able to take up what it eats. And therefore what comes out of the fish is, is waste is reduced because all of this is done in a process that allows the fish to take up most of the, most of the feed that it eats. Okay. So my next section, I'm going to look at the aqua feeds range. This is the, all of the feeds that are included in the upper feed range. So the first feeds are starter feeds. Starter feeds are crumbles and they are broken down into three stages, which is starter one, starter two, and starter three. So uh, the starter one, it's a small crumble. The starter two is a medium crumble and the starter three is a large crumble. So you'll find that starter one, starter two, and starter three are essentially identical in terms of the nutrients that they contain. This is because it, they come from the same pellet. So a pellet is formed by using the process that I just explained. And then this pellet is then crumbled and sifted. So when sifting, it is sifted into the different <coughs> sizes of, of the crumbles, which would then give us our small, our medium, and our large crumbles. But essentially this feed comes from one pellet so nutritionally, it is identical. So these three feeds are 45% in protein. You find that the highest protein in feeds is found in the starter feeds. When the fish are still small, that is when they require most of the protein. They are still growing, their internal organs are still developing. So they need a feed that is very high in protein to support um, this growth and this development that the fish is going through. And also you find that if a fish gets the right start. If a fish gets a strong start in terms of feed and in terms of nutrition, then this will set it for the rest of its life. Um, it will encounter less challenges in terms of diseases and, and stunting growth if we give the fish the start that it, that it requires. So for a starter one, um, it is fed um, to fish that are between 0 0.6 grams and one gram. Uh, you'll find that I started at 0 0.6 because Smaller than our starter one, we've got starter zero. But starter zero is mainly used in the HRS um, when um, 
the fry are, are hatched from the egg until they are about 0 0.5 grams and they are then sold to farmers. So most farmers will start at either starter one or starter two. And then we recommend also that um, starter one is fed eight times a day. Um, it is also very important uh, for small fish to get, the meals will be small, but they need to be frequent. So you'll be feeding small meals, but frequent throughout the daylight hours. So these eight times should be spread through, throughout the daylight hours. I'm going to give an example today, from about eight o'clock to, to 4 p.m. Um, you don't want to start too early because your water temperatures will still be low. They want to wait for the water temperatures to increase a bit because this will allow the fish to have um, um, a higher appetite than when the temperatures are so low. So between eight and nine, first feeding, and you also don't want to be feeding too late in the day because also your oxygen levels will start going down. So you want to feed before that, that happens. So to say uh, last feed between four to five, but this will also depend on, on the seasons. And then from starter two, we move to starter three. Starter three is given to fish that are between one and five grams. Um, and um, uh, we recommend feeding six times a day for, for starter two. And then starter three is given to fish that are between five and 15 grams. And um, we also recommend feeding this uh, four times a day. Um, I will move on to the next feed. So from the starter stage, we move on to the juvenile stage um, in, in fish feeds. Um, as you will see there, the protein content will decline from the initial 45% to 40% in juvenile one. Um, this is because, like I explained earlier, as the fish is getting bigger, they will require less protein. And because protein, you find that it's, it's, it's a bulky, but also an expensive part of the feed. So you want to give the fish only what it requires so that the cost of the feed is also reduced. So juvenile one is given to fish that weigh between 50 and 15 and 50 grams. And um, uh, it is given for a four week period. I just realized that there's something that I didn't mention in starter feed, so I will go back a bit. So our, for our starter one, starter one, we use it for a two week period. That is what will get us from the 0 0.6 to the one gram. And then our starter two, we'll use it for a three week period that will get us from our one gram to our five grams. And starter three for a three week period, which will get us from our five grams to 15 grams. Juvenile one, it is also given for four weeks now. Um, the four week period will get us from the 15 grams to the 50 grams. So I will share with you a table later on in the presentation of how much of each you should be giving to, to the fish. Um, and then from juvenile one, we move on to juvenile two. Um, also the protein level declines from 40% to 36%. And this is given to fish that are between 50 and, and 100 grams. And this feed is used for, for four weeks. And the feeding frequency is three times a day. And then the last stage is growth feed. So for growth feed, there are two options. First option is, um, is the grower, which is 32% in protein. Uh, and this is given to fish that are between 100. Uh, you can use it to 350 or up to whatever harvest size that you want to take out your fish at. So if you, for example, decide that you want to grow your fish to 350 grams, um, you will feed your fish for 10 weeks on grower feed. And this will get you from the 100 grams to 350 grams. And also the feeding frequency three times a day. On the grower feed or on the grower stage, there is also another option to use pond pellets. So pond pellets are a supplementary feed that are used by farmers who have green water. Um, Mr. Caetano touched a bit on, on, on this, on the option of using green water to grow your fish. So green water is basically when you have um, uh, algae or plankton, zooplankton or phytoplankton in the pond. 
So you can use fertilizers, inorganic or organic fertilizers to promote the growth of plantain in your pond. So when you're using this system, you can use pond feed as a supplementary, as a supplementary feed. Um, it's 18% in protein. You will note there that the protein levels are, um, are quite low uh, because this is assuming that the fish are getting also extra nutrients from the zooplankton and the phytoplankton that they are feeding from. So there are two options that a farmer can, can choose to take when they get to the grow stage. Either to uh, feed their fish on the grow feed 32% or to move to pond feed 18%, also depending on the, on the production system that they're using. And then we also have a broodstock feed. Broodstock feed, it's specifically for fish that are meant for breeding. Um, uh, for hatcheries or anyone who would want to breed their own fry, um, it is recommended that they put their males and their females, their breeding fish on broodstock fish, on broodstock, broodstock feed, sorry. So this is a um, high protein feed, it's 36% in protein, same protein content as our juvenile optum. Um, and it, it's higher in protein than goa because breeding fish require extra protein because of the work that they are doing. Um, the females, uh, they require extra protein to develop healthy and viable eggs uh, so that also they give out, they give out frying that are healthy. And uh, there's also increased vitamin C and vitamin E in the broodstock feed to support this um, process of, um, of breeding. So it is also recommended for farmers who are breeding fry to put their fish on, on broodstock feed so that they can increase the fecundity of them of their breeding fish. Okay, so my next table, um, it's, um, it's, a, it's an aqua feeds feeding regime. Um, it is recommended or it is prudent for farmers who are using commercial feed to get um, advice from the producer of the feed that they're using on how best to use the feed and how they can they can get the best results from the feed that, um, that they're using. So this table, it's, um, it's aqua feed's recommendation on how to use the feed so as to get the best results. Um, there are two issues when we're looking at, um, at, at fish feeds or feeding. And I think this applies in not only fish, but in, in animal husbandry in general. Um, the first issue is you do not want to underfeed. When you underfeed, uh, particularly in, in fish, what happens is feeding hierarchies will form. They, are, they will be dominant feeders in the pond or in the cage or in the tanks. Um, these dominant feeders, will, they will be very aggressive. So they will go to the front and eat all the feed. Uh, and you get fish that are um, 150 grams in the same point that you have fish that are still 50 grams because you're underfeeding, your dominant feeders will always go to the front and because they're aggressive, take up all the feed and then the smaller fish will outgrow and then your bigger fish will continue to grow. So that's the first challenge that you, that you get. Um, because of the feeding hierarchies, you find that there'll be very large size variance in your stock. Um, if, if we're taking, for example, that the example that I just, just gave earlier to say you left, fish that are 150 grams and fish that are, that are 50 grams, but these are fish that are uh, in the same environment, they were stocked on the same day, but because of um, not feeding enough, you get these very different um, sizes. And also your, your, your dominant feeders or your, your less dominant feeders, um, they will not grow as you would expect. You harvest your fish, you're expecting to harvest um, three tons because you think your average weight is 250 grams. But because you've got the very small fish, this will affect your, your, your target output. And then the other challenge that you get when you're overfeeding, it's, um, the, now it's the other side now of, of the issue. Overfeeding, the first problem is you will be wasting feed because the fish will take up the feed that they 
require and the less in the rest of the feed you will just be literally just feeding the water because this will not benefit you as the farmer in any way and um this excess feed, uh, particularly if you're talking about pond farming, will affect the water quality. So your water quality will deteriorate quickly uh, because you've got all of this excess feed that is rotting at the bottom of the pond. Um, and it will increase your pumping cost because now you need to continue to pump in water so that you can refresh your water. And yet the cause of this is it's overfeeding. So it is very important for, for your farmer to get recommendations from the supply of the feed that they're using and also to try to seek these recommendations so that they get the best out of the feed that they're using. So um, we can look at the table now. Um, our feeds, uh, I have gone through the list of the feeds starting from our starter one, starter two, starter three, juvenile one, juvenile two, and then go on. So this table shows... Um, the feeding recommendation for 1,000 1, fingerlings. Um, the, the first column there shows the protein content in the feed. Um, so the second column shows the protein content in the feed. And then the third column, it shows you um, the week. So it says feed until end of week. And then it says week six, week nine, so this is the week that you should stop using the feed and move on to the, to the next feed. And then the duration and that, that feed will be used in, in weeks. It's three weeks that are one, three weeks that are two, three weeks that are three, four weeks juvenile one, four weeks juvenile two, and 10 weeks will go on. And then the next column, it shows the frequency, how many times a day you should be feeding. So you see that it shows they clearly that for the small fish, you started um, eight times a day, but now the amount of times that you feed the day will be declining as the fish get, um, get bigger. You know, like I explained um, that small fish, they require regular feeds, although these feeds will be small, but they require regular feeds. Take an example for a baby. Uh, you can feed your baby up to six meals a day, and then adults will have two or three meals in a day. So it's the same thing with fish. They require um, uh, regular feeding when they are smaller, but as they get bigger, the frequency will decline. And when we get to grow our feed, we'll be feeding about three times a day for, um, for the fish. But the rule is still the same. We need to feed um, during the daylight hours. And these feeds should be spread throughout the day. So we don't want, uh, for example, when we're saying we're feeding three times a day, you feed at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and you say, I'm done, I fed my three times a day. No, we want these feeds to be spread throughout the day. So if the first feed is at nine o'clock, uh, second feed at 12 o'clock, and then the last feed at 3 p.m. or at 4 p.m. Um, this will allow the fish to get um, their feed through, throughout the day, allows them to digest the feed, and then take up um, take up the next for for the next feeding time, and then um, the next column is just shows, it shows the the, the bag sizes. Uh, sorry, um, the next column shows feed requirement for a thousand fish. So starter one require one kg of um, of 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 starter one. This one kg it's for the entire three week period, and then starter two five kgs also for three weeks. Start at three, 10 kgs um, for three weeks. Juvenile one, 35 kgs for four weeks. Uh, juvenile two, 75 kgs for four weeks. And grower, 250 kgs for 10 weeks. So you will see that clearly then, as the fish are getting bigger, the amount of feed that they require increases. Um, and how to work out the amount of feed that you give per each feeding time. So I will use, um, um, let's say, starter two as an example. So for starter two, we're saying we need five kgs to be fed um, over 21 days or three weeks. Uh, so to get daily feed, we'll say our five kgs divided by 21 days. That's the amount of feed that we should be feeding per day. And then after that, we need to further divide that by six because we're feeding six times a day. So we'll say the answer that we get divided by six, and this will give us the amount of feed that we should be giving the fish 
um, at each feeding time. Um, so I think there's always a, a bit of confusion around this, this feeding table to say, um, is this five kgs per day, is this five kgs per, per watt? So this five kg is for the entire period of three weeks. And we divide the five by 21 to get daily feed. And then we'll divide by six to get the amount of feed that we should be feeding per each feeding time. Okay, so when a farmer is, the decisions that the farmer has to make, um, the first one will be, do I use tanks? Do I use cages? Do I use ponds to grow my fish? And once they decide this or they make this decision, um, I think Mr. Gaetano touched on this one, the various factors that would determine on which production system will be best for the farm. I think another decision that the farmer has to make is, am I going to be using commercial feeds? Am I going to be uh, doing green water farming? Or am I going to be doing a combination of the two? So I'm just going to go through some of the disadvantages and advantages of commercial feeds and green water farming. Um, I feel that when a, when a person has the pros and the cons, then they can make a decision that is best suited to their, their circumstances. So normally commercial feeds are used in, um, in semi-intensive and intensive systems where the inputs are high, but also the outputs are high. And green water farming is mainly used in extensive systems where both inputs and also outputs um, are low. Then comparing growth rates, you will get higher growth rates when using, when using commercial feeds. The reason being, uh, when I started this presentation, I spoke about the formulation, the process of making the feed and the final output. So all of this, because the commercial feeds are specifically formulated to meet the nutritional requirements of the fish at that stage in its life. It means that the fish are getting the carbohydrates that they require, the proteins, the vitamins, the minerals, everything, the full package that they require for them to grow. So this will allow them to grow faster than fish that are um, uh, just feeding on plankton, zooplankton or phytoplankton, because it will be more of scavenging, they will just eat what they get on, on, on that particular day. But we also don't know how much they, they will be feeding from. So it's, it, this slows down growth. Uh, so comparing growth in the two systems, you get higher growth in your commercial feed and then slower growth in green water farming. Um, and also with uh, commercial feeds, you can predict um, your, your growth you know that if I give my fish five grams over a three week period, I can expect them to grow from one gram to five grams, assuming that all the other conditions um, are optimal to what they require. But with uh, green water farming, it is very difficult to predict uh, the growth of the fish because like I said earlier, you don't know how much they are consuming. Um, so it, it makes uh, production planning and prediction of when you can harvest your fish, it is very difficult for the farm. And then comparing survival rates, we expect the higher survival rates when feeding with um, commercial feeds as compared to, to green water farming. Uh, the reason for this is that you are giving your fish a balanced diet when, when, they, are, when they are being fed on commercial feeds. This means that um, uh, all the nutritional requirements are met. The fish are not um, are not compromised in any way in terms of in terms of nutrition. So you can expect that any deficiency issues um, are not you. You don't expect any deficiency issues in your fish. And if um, a disease does get into your stock, your fish are in a better position to be able to resist infection from diseases because they are being fed on a balanced diet and they are healthy fish are healthy themselves. Um, but with green water farming, um, this we expect a lower survival rate uh, because the fish might not be getting a, a balanced diet. So the next um, 
the next uh, comparison point is on costs. So you'll find that cost, uh, the cost of commercial feed makes up the bulk of the cost of the bulk of the operational cost that a farmer will incur. Um, I think this is also true for, for most of um, for broiler production or it might be pig gas pantry. You'll find that feed costs are the bulk of the cost and fish are no different. Um, uh, fish feeds, um, you'll find that they will make up more than 60% of the cost that the farmer will, will incur. Uh, that is why it is also very important for a farmer who decides that I want to use commercial feeds to know how to use these feeds um, appropriately so that they do not increase these costs unnecessarily. And then for green water farming, this is a, a very cheap way of, uh, of farming fish uh, with very little investment required. I find that most of um, the fertilizers that can be used to promote uh, green water farming are things that are found around um, around the farm or around the household, which is your chicken manure, your, your pig manure, or your cattle manure, or even your compost. So these are, are easily and cheap, cheaply available, which makes cost around green water farming lower compared to compared to commercial feed. And then um, comparing stocking densities, uh, commercial feeds allow for higher stocking densities because you're giving your fish the feed that they require, you can you can stock at a higher rate than what you would do with, uh, with clean water farming. Uh, with clean water farming, if you overstock, then there is a higher risk that your fish will not be getting the feed that they require. Now there's higher competition in, in the pond, uh, which makes it even more difficult for the fish to get the nutrients that they require in the clean water farming system. So lower stocking densities are usually recommended when, when farming in green water for fish. And then in, in terms of application, I've mentioned this before, uh, it is important for a farmer who is using commercial feed to get advice and recommendations from the supply of the fish feed that they're using so that they can get the best out of, out of, them, out of their investment. And then for green water farming, uh, green water farming needs to be monitored very closely uh, because there is a risk that if there is an algae bloom, um, um, algae or phytoplankton, they use up oxygen during the night. So during the day, they'll be photosynthesizing, they'll be producing oxygen, which is good for the fish, and then during the night, they'll be respiring. So there will be competition uh, with the use of oxygen with the fish. So there is a need to monitor green water farming closely so that the algae bloom does not okay and you do not get your fish suffocating because there is not enough oxygen in the pond. Um, you don't want there to be, to be competition and your fish to struggle to be breathing during the night uh, because there is too much algae in the pond. Okay, so um, I've touched on um, the process of making of making fish feeds uh, briefly on how that is done and the aqua feeds range. Uh, so my next slide it's on the distribution of of profits branches because this is where the fish feeds are found for farmers that are that are around the country. So all of those uh, orange and white dots that you see there in my map, those are profit shops where farmers can get. Um, can get um, their, their fish feeds. And that is just a listing uh, of all of the branches um, across the country. So at the moment we're we are working um, very hard to make sure that the full range of feeds are found or are available in, in each of those branches. Uh, we want to make it as convenient as possible for farmers to get their fish feeds when they require them. Uh, so um, those branches will be stocking the full range of, of fish feeds uh, for, for the convenience of, of the farmers. Okay, so thank you very much for, for listening. Um, my, our contact details 
they are there listed in, in this slide, which is my last slide. Uh, so you can get in touch with me in on any of those numbers if you have any questions or if you have any queries. Uh, so we'll be available to assist. Uh, so uh, yes, thank you very much for listening. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Majita, for that great presentation. It was very informative. And just a reminder to our participants that if you want to receive a link to the webinar recording, you can share your email addresses in the chat section. And if you're watching live on Facebook and you have a question for the presenters, please just type in your question in the comment section uh, or you can uh, directly inbox us. The same on our uh, on the Zoom platform, you can also post your question there uh, or you can inbox. So uh, Victor from Lake Harvest is ready for a presentation on the market uh, issues to do with the demand, uh, the selling prices, and also uh, gross margins. Victor, uh, you can go for it. Yes, this is Samantha from, from Lake Harvest. Um, so basically, as we all know, fish farming is one of the fastest and largest growing industries in Zimbabwe and worldwide. Um, and as Lake Harvest, uh, we value provision of quality fingerlings and um, quality brims to everyone in the country and outside. So in fingerling handling and transportation, our main objective is to transfer fingerlings under the best and optimal conditions and under minimal stress. So the kind of fingerlings that we sell as Lake Harvest, uh, we sell sexually reversed fingerlings. So these are basically now all males which have undergone the sexual reversal process. So we use a hormone called methyl testosterone um, to sex reverse our fingerlings. So why do we want males in comparison to females when we are stalking our pawns? Generally, um, males will channel most of their feed towards growth instead of sex, instead of reproduction. So they'll basically grow faster in comparison to females. And like what Majita was saying earlier, uh, when our fish are feeding, we have feeding hierarchy patterns. And it has been observed that males are mostly aggressive feeders when it comes to feeding. So for that reason, they grow faster because generally they are more aggressive when it comes to feeding. So that's why our fingerlings undergo sex reversal so that your turnaround time in terms of production is much less. So what do we mean when we say we want to transfer our fish under optimal conditions? Generally, when we refer to optimal conditions in fish movements and fish transfers, we are talking about factors such as water quality, as has been alluded earlier by Mr. Caetano. We are talking about uh, factors such as fish stress, and we're talking about how best we can optimize these conditions so that our fish are transferred in the best way possible. So when it comes to water quality, what we expect before doing any fish movement or transferring any fingerlings from our side is we expect our dissolved oxygen levels and temperature levels to be within a certain range. So if our dissolved oxygen levels and our temperature levels are within a certain range, that way when we move our fish, our fish do not get stressed easily and our mortality numbers will be lower. So we expect our dissolved oxygen levels to be between six to nine milligrams per liter. And we expect our temperatures to be between 25 to 28 degrees Celsius. So if our temperatures are below 24 degrees Celsius, we actually hold transfers and don't move any fish at all because our fish will be affected. Then if our temperatures are above 28 degrees Celsius, um, we use ice to aid us in trying to reduce the temperatures. So basically, why do we not want our temperatures to be very high when doing our fish movements? If our temperatures become very high, 
oxygen consumption of the fish also becomes very, very high. So when we are transferring our fish, be it in terms or be it in pecs, if oxygen consumption becomes very, very high, it means the oxygen levels in the pecs will be depleted before the fish gets where they want to get. Or our oxygen, if we're using cylinders or canisters, will be depleted before our fish get to their destination. So our fish will die in transit from lack of oxygen. Another key point to note before transferring any fingerlings or before handling any fish, be it in the pond or be it from our side when we do ourselves, we need to check the fish condition. This is very critical in assessing whether or not your fish are fit to be transferred. So what do we check for when we're checking for the fish condition? Generally, we check for the fish swimming patterns. If our fish exhibit odd swimming, swimming patterns, such as um, swimming from the bottom of the pond or gasping for air at the top of the pond, it basically means either our fish are lacking in oxygen or the water quality in that pond is poor. So generally, our fish won't be fit for transfer. We also check to feeding. We also check feeding patterns prior to starvation of the fish before transfer. So generally, if your fish are stressed or if your fish are sick, you will notice that the response in terms of feeding will be very low. So that basically means that if you're going to starve your fish before transferring, your fish might not be fit for what you want to do. So in order to optimize our water quality when transferring our fish, we, we use salt to minimize stress. So basically we use 0 0.5 parts per thousand as our concentration in whatever volume of water that we'll be transferring in. So when we transfer our fingerlings from, from Lake Harvest Cariba, usually to our customers in Arare or anywhere around the country, we either transfer our fish in 1,000 liter tubs or we use polyethylene plastic bags and boxes to secure our plastic bags. So when we're using um, 1,000 liter tubs, we make sure that we use cylinders to provide oxygen in transit. And, we are, and when we're using polyethylene plastic bags, we have to make sure that when we put our volume of water in our polyethylene plastic bags, we then make sure that our plastic bags are well aerated by introducing oxygen into the bag and then tightly sealing the plastic bag so that it will get wherever it wants to get. So basically for our polyethylene plastic bags, which are 0 0.8 by 0 0.46 meters in, in size, we stock 500 fingerlings at one gram in about 10 liters of water. So based on the trials that we've carried out, these will basically last almost 30 hours in transit. So you're guaranteed that if you want your fingerlings to be transferred from, for example, Kariba to wherever in the country, if it's within this space of 30 hours, you will get your fingerlings whilst they are still in good condition. If, however, you have a larger consignment, and um, you have more fingerlings that you want to buy and you have a greater distance. We will, however, suggest that our farmers use tubs to transfer the fish. So because tubs use um, mobile oxygen cylinders, as long as you have enough cylinders, you can transfer your fish to wherever you want to get them. So basically, why do we encourage that temperatures should be within a certain range? Like I've said earlier, if temperatures are high, then oxygen consumption will be high. So generally, our fish will struggle if oxygen is depleted. So that's why we encourage that we move our fish when temperatures are within a certain range. So um, I will circulate a PowerPoint presentation with stocking densities of how we stock our boxes and now we stock our plastic bags. So generally, you're supposed to adjust your stocking densities based on the size of the fish. So if your fish are bigger 
generally your biomass will be up in terms of stocking in boxes, but the number of fish per box will be lower. So on arrival, when your fish get to where you want to get them, fish should be acclimatized first to the environment that you want to introduce them to before introducing them to the pond or the dam. So what do we mean by acclimatization of the fish first? In order to acclimatize your fish, you need to make sure that if you're transferring the fish using polyethylene plastic bags, you need to make sure that you place your polyethylene plastic bags on top of the water in the pond or on top of the water in the dam that you want to transfer your fish to so that they are acclimatized to the required temperatures. If you reintroduce your fish to the dam or to the pond suddenly, your fish are likely to experience something that we call temperature shock. It basically means that the temperatures that they are used to now and the temperatures that you've introduced them to are drastically different. So because of that, you don't give your fish enough time to adjust. They will experience the temperature shock and they will die. So if you're using tabs, the best way for you to acclimatize your fish to the new environment would be to gradually introduce the water from the pond or from the dam to the fish that you have. So how do you do that when you're using tabs? When you're using tabs, you just basically recirculate whatever water you have with the water from the dam. So that will basically enable your fish to adjust to the temperatures that they are coming from and the temperatures that they're going into. So this will be the best way to reintroduce the fish into the system. So after acclimatizing your fish, when introducing the fish to the fish system, you should gradually add them to the system. You can't pour your fish into the pond or into the dam. You need to do the process gradually so that your fish do not go into shock. So I've also attached um, um, contact details to the PowerPoint presentation that I'll circulate. For anyone who has any questions in terms of fingerling movement, fingerling cells, and fingerling stocking. So those contacts are available to everyone. You can contact me or my colleagues will be able to assist when it comes to fingerlings and handling and transportation. So I'll circulate a PowerPoint presentation after this. And if anyone has any questions, you can attach the questions to the group chat. I think uh, that is the short presentation on fingerling handling and fingerling movement. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Samantha, for the great presentation. If you have any questions for Samantha, like she said, please just post in the chat section. Then she'll be able to respond to the questions later on. Then next uh, presentation is Mr. Caetano. He will touch on pond management. Why fish pond management is important in the cage culture, on was it allows a fish farmer to monitor the growth of his or her fish, the production of his or her fish, at the same time, the survival. You cannot farm fish without knowing whether the fish grows or they are growing, whether the fish are performing better when you feed them or they're not feeding, whether the fish are still available in the pond or not available in the pond. So what you need to do is to do pond, pond management. But pond management varies with different types of farming practice. We have got uh, three types of farming that subsistence, semi-commercial, and commercial. You would find that on subsistence, pond pond management is minimal. Then the uh, same commercial, of course, they try now to upgrade the systems so that uh, they can realize uh, their profits by the end of the day. So as the commercial. Factors that we need to consider when managing the pond. Uh, number one factor is the, the pond design. 
you will find that uh, people are just digging pawns, just digging some pools or some water bodies. But with those water bodies, they are digging able to keep fish to grow for a certain period. Are they able to keep fish of a good number? So when you design your pond, you need to consider what exactly you want. Every pond must have some water exchange pipes. The key pipe on a pond is a waste outlet pipe, which is put right underneath at the deeper end of the pond. That pipe has to flush out the pond waste, the feces, the gases waste exchanges that are in the pond flush out so that the fish in the pond will survive well and perform better. And when designing a pond, you just don't dig a wall or a dam. But you need to understand the specifications if they're correct. When constructing it, make sure your pond has got a deeper end and your pond has got a shallow end. The reason for the deeper end is to allow an easier flow of waste to the deeper end where the water outlet, the waste outlet pipe is. At the same time, when the inlet is putting water in the pond, the inlet must be at the shallow end. So when the pond is deeper to the other side and the inlet is putting water in from the shallow end, it means the water is pushed right to the whole pond. It's another area or another uh, practice of aerating your pond as well refreshing your water in the whole pond. So you need to consider how the pond is designed is the first thing. You need also to understand the type of soil where you are going to put the pond. Check the permeability or porosity levels of your pond, of your water, of your soil. That will determine whether they are going to use a dam line or other sources of constructing a pond using different materials. But if you don't know the permeability levels of your soil, you just dig something, it means you lose water when you, you fill that pond with water. Check also your water source. Which water source are you using? Is it a bowl? Is it a river? Or a seepage? So those are critical issues. As I mentioned earlier, security plays a key role again. Then the type of fish fish you are farming attracts a certain management system different from other species. Understand the feeding regime. Are you going to feed your pond, your fish, using only green water? Or you are going to use the compound feeds as well? So all these things you need to take into consideration and adequate finances. Because you do not want to come one day and say, sorry, I've run short of money to buy feed. Your fish, they are right in the pond, they want to eat, and then now you don't have money to feed your fish. It means your fish want to grow. There is no reason now. That justifies why I'm growing fish. So all these things are the factors you need to consider before you embark into pond farming. When you are money manage, managing your pond, number one issue you need to do monitoring issues. What do you monitor? You understand water is the key component 
for fish to live in. The whole life of a fish is in water. So make sure you've got adequate water. Every day, you need to check the main water intake. Where is your water coming from? How is the intake like? Is there no end damage to the intake? So that is not bringing water into my pond. Make sure you clean it. Make sure you repair it. Make sure you adjust it. Every day check the water feeder, canal. If you are using canals, are they feeding water into your pond? Or something has broken the canal. Can you repay, clean and adjust. And these are the monitoring that you need to check each and every day. Check also your pond inlets. Are they okay? Are they bringing in water? How is the water like? Repay and adjust. You need also to monitor your pond itself as an infrastructure. Check if your pond water levels are well. As we said, that at the deeper end, the water level should be at one and a half meter. Maybe 0 0.5 to 0 0.75 at the shallow end, depending on the design. But your water level should be right at the right level. When you see your water level has gone down, it means you have to refill your water. Because the moment you leave your water levels, goes down. Because they, the water level can go down either through evaporation, either through leaks, or in other means, or during waste pipe outlet systems. So when they go down, make sure you have replaced that water back into the pond. On both the stocking density that you have used are calculated according to the volume. The volume is the water. Every day, check your water quality. Look using your eyes and see the color of your water. Look and see the phytoplankton in your water and the turbidity, how transparent the water is. The water color will tell you whether your water is good or your water is not good. Then you have to flush it out through the waste pipe and refresh through the inlets. This is an everyday work that you need to check. Why only because you want your fish to live in a friendly environment where they can grow well, where they can achieve good survival, where they can achieve good production. Every day you need to check and repay and protect the body dogs. Other people, when they're building some ponds, they build a very thin dike wall. At the end, that dike will just get damaged and all water goes out. Make sure your dike is strong and you check it in every day. Other people, they plant grass like lawn, what is to strengthen the dike. So make sure the dike is strong. No point which is weak that can allow water in the pond to go out. Almost if we do that, it means our fish will die. Almost all the water we have gone. Every day check the bottom mud and control the thickness and quality of your water. You cannot allow your pond to have a lot of mud at the bottom. One, it means you have reduced the volume. Every day check and control the aquatic vegetation. Like what Masuta uh, said on the algae bloom. Algae is good. Algae is bad. 
So it has to be managed. So you check it using the transparent search disk. That's stability. Then when the algae bloom is bad, flush out water and then fresh through the inlet pipes. Almost those who play coward to your fish growth, save up and production. Then every day check and control pests in your pond. Because we don't want pests or predators to disturb your fish welfare. On monitoring, you also need to monitor your fish every day. Check your fish behavior. Just look to your fish. Are your fish active? How are they swimming in the pond? Is there an awkward behavior that you're observing on your fish? If it is that, find out what could be the problem. Maybe your fish are affected by bacteria. Maybe your fish have been damaged, discarded. So you need to check all those things each and every day. Every day, check how your fish are responding to feeding. You cannot just throw feed in your pond. You need to understand how to feed your fish every day. The position where you feed your fish, the timetables when you feed your fish, the amount of feed that is supposed to be fed at every frequent. As you don't feed all feed of the day once, but you divide it into frequents. Then when you're feeding, use the responsive method. You don't feed when the, your fish doesn't want to eat feed. Because the things that uh, disallows your fish to eat are many, varies. Maybe the conditions of the weather are not allowing your fish to feed. So you cannot just throw your feed, you'll be losing money. As you heard from us, Peter saying, feed demands the greater costs of your fish production. So you cannot afford to lose feed. Make sure every feed that you feed to your pond, you're not feeding to the water, you are feeding right to the mouth of the fish. So you will feed on response and take time when feeding. 10 to 15 minutes feeding on response, broadcasting of feed, whilst you're observing how your fish are responding to feed. When your fish stop responding to feed, so you stop feeding. Then you calculate how much feed has been eaten and how much feed has been left from your container. Then you put it on record. Every day, check the healthiness of your fish. Are there any no fish which are wounded? Are there no any fish which are discarded or damaged eyes or pale in color? A sign of a disease. Then you take the right precaution when you observe that. Every day, make sure you remove mortalities. If any in the pond, well, if you leave the mortalities in the pond, it means you, the, your fish will eat the dead fish and they get affected if those fish died because of a disease. So you cannot afford to leave mortalities right in the pond. Make sure you remove mortalities every day. You also need to monitor issues to do with the farm. I think somebody asked a question on the security issues. It's part of pond management. Every day you need to check theft control. Fish will tell you that you have been disturbed, either by a predator 
We have got human predators who like to uh, steal fish from the ponds. They will tell you. Whenever you go to the pond, when the fish are disturbed, they don't want to come up. You see them down. And you think, where are my fish? Where have they gone? But every day they used to come up on top when you are coming to the pond so that they want to feed. But because they've been disturbed by a thief who wanted to store fish, the fish will start to hide from you. Check the surroundings. Make sure you prepare the surroundings that are clear, visible, so that you distract the thieves to come and steal your fish. You may even fence the fish pond, depending on the, uh, the size of your farm. You may need to employ even guards. You may need even to put some CCTV so that you can control what you are at very far points. Just try by all means to put any measures that will control thefts. I also wanted to say something on the point that uh, remember, you need to check to make sure that your pond is a bed in it. There are some fish, some beds, I mean, which it's your fish. And if you allow them to come to your pond and if you allow them to eat your fish, for example, if every day bears comes to take 10 of your fish every day. Per month, you are losing around 300 fish. What about two months, three months, four months? At the end, when you want to harvest, you will find that the amount of fish against the mortality that you picked, against the survivors that you have achieved at, at harvest, doesn't correspond. But because the birds have been eating your fish unnoticeably. So it's important to have a predator bed in it to cover the top of your fish pond so that you won't lose stocks. There are some gadgets that you need to have so that you are able to monitor other parameters of your water quality. We have some water test meters for measuring water temperatures because temperature is key to the growth of fish. Temperature is key to the performance, survival and production of fish in a pond or even in any model of farming. So you cannot just test water temperature by putting your hand or looking. You need to afford and buy a water temperature. You need to buy a dissolved oxygen meter. There are some gadgets which comes in, uh, in two, which can measure temperature at once or dissolved oxygen at once. And this dissolved oxygen and the temperature must be measured every day three times if things are normal, which means at six in the morning, at 12 in the afternoon, and at six in the evening, record those temperatures. Record that, those dissolved oxygen levels that you are measuring. Then be able to analyze. Both those measurements will tell you how bad your water quality is how bad the conditions are, why your fish have not, are not interested in eating feed. Those meters will tell you. You need to have a such disk for measuring the tra water transference. You can even design a manual one where you can either dip your hand or you can dip that manual one that you have made right into the water. And when you don't see it, then you measure the distance between that disk and the, where the water level is, when you start not to see uh, that disk in the water. 
when that one is below 25 centimeters, it means your water is stability. You need to refresh it. So this should be done every day at a port. That is if you want to make your fish farming a real business. Make sure every day you check all these control measures and measure the plankton level, that's the algae. It mustn't be too much. It mustn't be too little. So check the color, dark or light. It has to be pea green. When you are using uh, manure to feed your pond, you need to understand how to fertilize your pond. understand how to fertilize your pond and what the quantities of manure are you to put in a certain size of a pond. Manure can come from chicken, manure can come from pig, manure can come from cow manure, but these manure, because of where they come from, they've got different strength. If you're using chicken manure, you're asked to put 30 grams per square meter, 50 grams per square meter if it is pig manure, 70 grams per square meter if you are using cow manure. And you don't put those manure direct, no, but you put them in a sack that accurates tight and place that sack with the manure in the pond and leave it to dissolve. What you want is the concentration of that manure to go into the water, pond water. That's what, that's how we fertilize the pond. If you don't have the manure, of course you can use even ammonia nitrate fertilizer. You only need for the measurements. About 20 kgs per 200 square meter pond. Get that. So you need to understand the follow. What is manure? Why manure? Because manure manufactures algae. In algae, it gets some planktons, which are food to our fish. Make sure your water color should always achieve pea green color, not dark or light, as I said. If green water is your only means of feeding, make sure every week you do this once and control your water quality. As I say, don't put manure direct. You need also to control your stocks. on a fish pond. You need to continually do some fish sampling. You cannot run a business without carrying out some stock checks. Do stock checks each and every time periodically. I think we had Mazita saying that they started one, started two, started three, a juvenile one, two, and growers and whatever. And they, with their periods, when you use started two, from fish one to five gram. It means after 20 to 21 days, if you stopped one gram fish, you must achieve five grams or more at the end of the 20 days. So if you don't do these samples to check growth, to check the performance of your feed, to check whether your guys or you are feeding well or not, to check whether your fish are eating or not eating, are growing or not growing. But you can only do this when you are carrying out some samples periodically. And in under, you need to understand some golden rules before you do that, that you will first starve your fish for 48 hours before you carry any sample, before you handle any fish. Those are the controls that you need to do. Check if your fish have some variations, serious variations. You will find that uh, some of the fish are too small. In the same pond, the fish are too big. 
they cannot live in the same pond together. If those variations are there, you better remove the bigger fish to another water body and they leave the same size fish. Only because they compete in feeding. And bigger fish are always aggressive to the disadvantage of a small fish. So it means whenever you're putting feed, you're only feeding bigger fish and the bigger fish are the only ones growing. The small fish are not growing only because of the aggressiveness of the bigger fish. They bully. So, I mean, the good practice is to check the variations and try by all means to grade your fish so that you keep same size fish which are uniform in one unity. That's the practice. That is if you mean a real business to make profit. So, so take off bigger fish. And remember, fish they can balage. If you don't do that, if you don't do that, you can lose your fish through cannibalism. And you don't know. At the end of the day, when you want to harvest, your survival is low. You have lost your fish only because you didn't check variations. So I'm saying this is part of pond management, which you need to exercise every day. Like any other business, you also need to do some record keeping. You need to do some record keeping. You cannot just put fish without knowing how many fish are you stocking at the pond. You need to understand the carrying capacity of your pond according to this design. You need to record the mortalities whenever they're okay so that you subtract the mortalities from the stock on record. You need to record your feed and the frequency you're feeding your feed each and every day. You need to record the average body weight on samples so that you understand the actual growth and the targeted growth. Then try to analyze the difference and come out of the, with the reasons why my fish haven't grown to this size, why my fish have surpassed the target growth. You need to understand all these things. We oh, are doing good, we are not doing good. So that you can con correct before you are at the ending. You correct it when it is earlier to be corrected than leaving it like that. Because this is business. Remember, you need also to have some records of the feed rates. Fish eat differently according to their sizes. So you need to understand the feed rates of every size of your fish so that each and every day you get the changes of the amount of feed you are now giving your, your fish and your timetables. So this is more about pond management. When you do this, you are likely to achieve best yield at the end of the day. The stocking densities for a pond, they vary. They vary, it are not the same. The level of water exchange you put to your pond will allow you to put more fish per square meter. The level, this is the reason why it's difficult for people to say, no, I achieved so many cages per square meter or whatever. It depends on the design of your pond. When you want to achieve more biomass per area, you need to employ some water exchange regularly. You need to employ some gadgets like, uh, like air returns or oxygen blowers, so that you regularly put oxygen in your water body. 
on board the pond is like a stagnant water. There is no way that pond is going to get other oxygen. Remember, don't let your pond have wastes. Don't let your pond have wastes. You must make sure you are monitoring that. Only because when you leave waste in your pond, that waste will produce or will form ammonia gases. And one pound of ammonia is only neutralized by four pounds of oxygen or 4.6 pounds of oxygen. So good oxygen in water is not more than seven parts PPT. So if you have got more ammonia, which exceeds the amount of oxygen in your water body, it means your fish suffers. They die. They don't grow. Every day you need to check that, even by looking at the baby of your fish, if they are gasping or not gasping. Because gasping is a sign of depletion. And what can deplete oxygen? Maybe the algae is too much. Maybe there is no water circulation. Maybe the ammonia is too much. Maybe the quality of water is so dirty. You need to guard over all those things. Thanks very much. This is the little on the point management that I thought I may share with you. God bless. Thank you very much, Mr. Caetano, for that great presentation. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the association is the hub for, for information. As you can see, this uh, very important information and key issues being addressed in, in, in this presentation. Thank you. And our next presentation is coming from Victor, is with uh, Lake Harvest. Victor, you can go for it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Samantha, for uh, such a great presentation, uh, Mazrita and uh, Mr. Kaitano, for um, for sharing such uh, nuggets of information with our customers. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to try and uh, uh, consummate the 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 last end of the whole fish farming business, which uh, ends up with the customer. So basically what, uh, what I'm going to do here is, um, um, you know, to try and explain the size of the market we have at our disposal in Zimbabwe, to uh, explain um, the, the fish economics as in the, the margin analysis, of um, from for, from a small farmer perspective, calculating how they can calculate or what gross profit they can expect from their fish farming business, and um, uh, most of our farmers have, uh, from my experience, I have met a lot of uh, small fish farmers who have uh, uh, done well in in farming the fish, and uh, but unfortunately um uh, fail when it comes to the market and eventually they they they, they crumble like a deck of cards so um basically uh as lake harvest we are actually on a mission to um to to change the the, the fish eating habits in zimbabwe because if you notice um zimbabwe generally is a is a, a chicken and uh, probably beef eating country, uh, which makes uh, an average uh, family take maybe uh, fish once or, or twice a month. Uh, this gives us um, um, 
uh, a leeway to say there is a lot of untapped marketing the, in, the, in, in the country. And um, uh, from the, the av an average of about 3,000 metric tons we are, we are selling per annum in, in the country, it's, it's something we can grow to maybe 10,000 or so ways even considering the fact that uh, when uh, mackerel, horse mackerel was uh, being imported in full force uh, around 2018, 2017, we, the country uh, could import up to, up to 20 to 25 metric tons of this mackerel fish and it will all be absorbed in, in, in Zimbabwe. So this gives us um, uh, a, a clear picture that there is huge untapped market in the in the in the country and uh, we would like to use such forums as this one to try and um, um, encourage our fish farmers that uh, this is something they can do as long as they, they they do it right they can also help us to 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 market uh, this um, fish farming uh, or, or the the taking or the consumption of fish in Zimbabwe thank you so much like I've um, uh, highlighted in my introduction, um, the presentation will be basically on margin analysis and um, uh, the fish markets. I will also um, uh, demystify the unmarketed uh, ideas or, or, or unique selling points for fish, which farmers, uh, the, the, the aspire, aspiring farmers we have in this forum can help us uh, um, market the fish so that we increase uh, fish consumption in Zimbabwe. You will notice, uh, I will try and start from the consumer, consumer behavior uh, perspective, looking at fish, fish uh, eating in Zimbabwe. You will notice that uh, across, across the border in Zambia, we uh, people, uh, they, are, they are basically fish eating people in, Zimb in Zambia. They, they they take fish for more than more than two times two times a week and uh, uh, it's actually part of their um, part of their of, of their meals all the time which is different in Zimbabwe and you you notice that we struggle we struggle to sell a, a, a poultry uh, uh, 250 tons a month of brim of tilapia brim in Zimbabwe mainly because um, uh, consumers have got their own, um, when they are doing their purchasing, uh, uh, they have got their own perception when it comes to fish and um, it's, it's something which we all need, uh, like people in this platform, to try and, and demystify and educate our customers of um, the, the advantages of taking tilapia or, or taking fish in general. Um, ahead of other 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 um, other meats like chicken and, and beef. At the end of my presentation, I am going to uh, to quickly walk through the the advantages of taking fish, uh, which uh, our 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 farmers can also use as the the market and uh, and sell their fish. So, without further uh, further um, wasting much of your time. Um, that is basically our, our shop in Arare, Lake Harvest Shop, uh, where we, um, we take our fish from Kariba and we sell through our Semo Masero the Road shop. The margin analysis. Um, if you look at that table, like Mr. Kaitona has highlighted before, there are several models to this fish farming. Uh, so these are... Uh, uh, economics or the calculations of profitability differ from one model to another. This one is just a general calculation um, of, of, of margin in Zimbabwe. So the assumption there is uh, a farmer stocks about 100,000 fish. Um, normally, if you feed about 100,000, if you stock about 100,000 fish, you uh, you should expect to have it's around 40, 40 tons of, of, of fish uh, after about five to six months. And you need about um, about 64 tons of, of feed. The highlighted in red there is the food conversion ratio, which differs also um, from a 
the tour of um, variables is highlighted by 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 Masuita on um, the the uh, but is highlighted by Kaitano before um, um, considering management of variables in the in the ponds, the temperatures, the the, the alkalinity of the water, uh, so many variables, uh, and uh, that FCR uh, food conversion ratio can actually move down or up. It's, it's a game changer to the cost per kg for, for, for the farmer. So uh, as we uh, consummate this presentation, Mr. Caetano highlighting the point management um, uh, issues, it's, it's something we, we need to pay attention to because if you don't pay, if you don't uh, manage our ponds, if you don't manage our feeding, that ratio can actually um, go up and it means you get little um, uh, fish, you have less fish, but you they fed uh, a lot of feed. So the uh, on average, a, a bag of feed, a 25 kg bag of feed from, from profits would cost you about 18 to 20 bucks. Uh, you will notice that um, these feeds define price from the juvenile feed uh, up to uh, up to is explained by 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 Masuita. The protein content in 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 this feed uh, determines the cost. And um, but I've just used an average of about uh, um, eighteen dollars per twenty five kg uh, a twenty five kg bag. That um, translates to about 80, 80 cents per per kg. But uh, I have made sure that I include other logistical costs, which will push up the, the feed cost uh, per kg to about 92, 92 cents per, per kg. So you will need um, about uh, 58,000 to feed uh, 100,000 fish to, um, to, to, to reach a size of about 500 grams uh, in five to six months. So um, the feed cost per kg will come up to about $1.47. Um, um, after, after a feeding, you need to uh, look at the processing part of it. Most farmers, um, they ignore this part and um, they end up running up and down like, like, like headless chickens after the, the, the fish has matured and they are trying to to look around for where they can uh, process their feed from their fish from. They try to push their fish to the to the market as ungutted, and um, that way they they realize uh, little margins. They uh, they don't plan for where they are going to be freezing their fish, and um, uh, all sorts of other um, uh, logistical issues. So, the processing part is basically. Uh, taking out your fish from the water, removing the guts, cleaning it. Uh, you need to freeze it. You need to pack it uh, ready for the market. Uh, the next line there, uh, which is uh, the fingerlings cost, that line is also uh, a bit variable because you will notice that for from lake harvest, you buy uh, your fingerlings at about 25, 25 US dollars a thousand. So for, uh, for 100,000 fingerlings, uh, which gives you about 40 tons, uh, calculating, uh, in granulating to that cost per kg, you get around six cents per kg. But um, this is only for, for farmers who are like buying fingerlings from, from, um, uh, from us. Uh, for for somebody who is actually doing the breeding and the, and uh, all the nitty gritties involved in the um, uh, in the uh, production of the fingerlings, that cost can actually come up to about um, I would say about twenty cents per kg. So I just on this uh, presentation, I just assumed somebody is 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 just buying the fingerlings from 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 uh, from lake harvest. And then going on to the distribution part of the, the, the issue, you need to plan how you are going to move your fish from the 
where you are farming the fish from, um, how you are going to, uh, to move the fish, uh, I mean, to, from where, where you are farming from to a place where you are freezing them, and then from that place to the final or the end consumer. Um, uh, normally, it to this this uh, transportation or the average charge of, of, of transporting fish or, or transporting enemies nowadays is, is, is it roughly ranges from from ten cents per kg to to around fifteen cents. Those are the cheapest. You can actually see some some other uh, transporters charging up to up to twenty cents per, per kg. So. Um, uh we also encourage our farmers to plan for for some storage space the reason why we do so is um normally the the, the, the fish market uh, fluctuates it, it depends with uh, how much um uh, mackerel is coming in how much um was for your own information if you notice in 2019 uh 2018 alone we uh, imported about 19,000 metric tons of mackerel, um, which went down to almost three tons only, a paltry three tons in, in, 20, in 2019. The main reason being um, the access to foreign currency. It's, it's very difficult to get access to foreign currency and uh, you need foreign currency to import uh, mackerel from, horse mackerel from Namibia. So um, uh, on the storage part, I was trying to explain that um, uh, if you plan for, your, for storage, uh, when the market is flooded or when you haven't uh, secured enough um, a market, you do not panic. Uh, you can just easily keep your fish in, in, in whatever storage facility. There's, the standard storage cost for a 40 foot container you you are looking at about seven hundred and fifty dollars uh, per month, and um, um, if it, uh, that uh, forty foot container normally um, uh, takes in about fifteen tons, fifteen to eighteen tons of of, of fish. So uh, calculating that, the average, your average monthly cost should be around 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 five cents per kg. So that one, I, I just assumed maybe you take uh, one and a half months or so to, to make sure that you clear your harvest. Okay. Um, going on to um, the, the, the selling prices, normally uh, the pricing differs and um, many, many buyers, if you look at uh, these supermarkets, the distributors, they normally bully the, the, the fish farmers and they end up giving away their, their, their fish. But on average, um, the, the lowest, uh, on, on average, the, the, the buy-in price is around to the last 40 per kg, which gives us a, a very thin margin of about 12%. And um, we, that need to be improved. You can only improve it by improving your, your, your FCR there and um, uh, maybe finding a better market with, with, with uh, a, a higher price. But um, what, what you notice, uh, there are issues to do with uh, write-offs, there are issues to do with uh, um, any other consumables involved. That, uh, that margin can be, can, be, uh, can be too thin. But however, uh, I'm going to move to my to the next slide to the second slide, um, which looks at um, uh, the marketing, the marketing part of it. Um, there are basically about four ways you can um, through which you can sell your 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 fish in in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, you can either go direct to the final consumer, maybe through butcheries or um, I have seen some some farmers actually parking their trucks by the corner of a road or something like that. You can list uh, with major supermarkets uh, like OKTM, um, Chopis, and so forth. You can uh, uh, approach wholesalers like uh, Koala, 
uh, you can also uh, do it through distributors like uh, Fresh Pro, Lake Harvest, Seaprite. So I've tried to, um, um, to explain the differences uh, in these uh, different markets, uh, the advantages and the uh, disadvantages, trying to decipher for, for our farmers to quickly decipher the, 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 the difference and, and where their options are there. So if you look at um, going direct to the, to the customer, uh, at the moment, you can you can uh, fetch prices as high as around two and two dollars fifty. Those are US dollars per kg. Um, but unfortunately, these these uh, these players do not move much volume, and uh, um, you end up incurring a lot of storage costs because uh, instead of that ten cents, which I I highlight I, I I assumed on the storage cost on my margin calculation. You may end up spending three months or four months trying to clear a harvest. So that's the disadvantage of going direct to the to the customer. There's also a high risk of um, of bad debts and actually a sizable amount of for administration needed. Uh, 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 the advantage is though um, uh, of of butcher is some can actually pay you in foreign currency. Uh, moving on to the to the next tire. Uh, where you actually approach yourself to 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 the supermarkets. These uh, most of the time, they I think they are the highest payers in the market. Um, you can fetch as much as around two dollars sixty per kg. Uh, but however, uh, this these customers, the this kind of customer, it it comes with a plethora of disadvantages, uh, especially to small players. You will notice that um, uh, the moment you list with them, they demand what they call uh, uh, rebates, which is a percentage they, they deduct from the amount uh, uh, the sales they you do through with, through them. Because they will be they will be saying, uh, we the more we expand or the more we open new shops, the more your product is exposed. Uh, to the market, so you should help us in the expansion process. They will charge you maybe around one percent rebate. They will also charge you um, uh, some 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 uh, early settlement discounts if you want your payment to come to come early. Uh, and you notice that you end up giving away uh, four around three to four percent of, of of your margin to them. The other problem with these uh, guys is um, they can take up to 21 days to, to, to pay you. And uh, in, in, in this inflationary environment, you, you are likely to be crippled, especially if you are a, a, a small farmer. Uh, the next tire there uh, will be the horse, your wholesalers. They, they are good volume movers. Uh, they normally pay in time. Um, Though uh, at times the 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 um the what what they do is they bully the bully fish farmers and end up um, fish farmers end up uh, paying very low low or getting very low value of their value of their product. Um, and then I move on to um, uh, the distributors. Your distributors, the advantage is um. Many times they can actually pick from your warehouse, pick the product from your warehouse. They um, they normally can uptake uh, all your all your harvest at once, and you know that you you can um, uh, get your money your money as a lancer. Uh, the disadvantage is the low prices they offer. Uh, like uh, given this around two dollars twenty per kg now. That's all on um, uh, the market, isn't the fish market. Um, I, I will quickly go through the, 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 the prices on the shelves right now in the market. The, the main reason why I, I included this slide on this presentation is uh, I want um, my fellow aspiring farmers uh, to understand that um, 
there is a uh, uh, we need there is something we need to unlock in in the in the fish fund or in the fish uh, market. You will notice that um, um, we take close to about six months growing our fish, um, feeding every day, like what Mazuta has been has highlighted there. But um, uh, chicken farmers they only take about six weeks to to grow their chicken. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, they actually use uh, uh, feed, which is around twenty, which is around twenty percent protein, or so. Which uh, eventually, which eventually becomes cheaper to them. Uh, but when it goes to the market, uh, these prices are were taken. Uh, actually, the prices which are in okay as we speak right now on the shelves, you notice that. Uh, our, our, our customers expect our fish to be to be to be cheaper than than chicken but we uh, if you calculate the cost of production the time we take growing this fish is actually um, uh, more than what uh, the chicken farmers uh, the time they take growing their, their their fish so the only way out is to try and um, uh, educate our customers on um, the advantages of eating eating fish uh, ahead of uh, ahead of chicken uh, as a group or, or, or as um, as uh, people in this platform we need to try and make sure that we trumpet about uh, the, the the advantages of um, of taking 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 fish especially uh, amid this covid 19 19 pandemic so you notice right now uh, the whole bed, the whole bed um, fish is going for about six six hundred nineteen per kg, you know, okay. And um, uh, our own fish, lake harvest, is going for 463, four hundred sixty three. These are RTGs, four hundred sixty three dollars per kg, uh, which is way cheaper. Uh, we are also because of um, uh the low supply of uh, in in wild caught there is there has been a, a spike increase in the in the demand for wild caught and you will notice that uh for some unfathomable reason wild caught is now actually more expensive than um than than um than our own farmed fish so the reason being Many customers are enamored with uh, wild bream. They believe it's natural. It's it's not like like uh, it's free range, and that advantage is uh, the the because of this shrinking disposable income. Uh, if you notice, uh, wild caught uh, fish is lighter in weight. So if you if you put on scale, same size um, fish uh, in length is in in length or width. If you put it on scale and then you put uh, a farmed fish on the scale, you notice that the weight is different. The, 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 the wild coat is lighter. So for a dollar, uh, a customer who is buying wild coat actually get more fish than a customer who is buying uh, farmed fish. So that's the other reason why, why, why wild coat is more popular. Um, on chicken, on beef, pork, and uh, those other meats, meats they mentioned, they, it's clear that it's actually more expensive than fish. But in my opinion, we have um, um, an insurmountable task ahead of us to try and convince the consumers that um, fish, um, they should actually uh, improve from eating fish once, once a month into trying to eat fish uh, maybe uh, once a week, uh, uh, for the following advantages. Uh, I've tried to, to summarize the advantages of uh, which our customers or our fellow uh, fish farmers here can use as the, um, uh, as use as unique selling points as uh, they try to convince their customers to eat more or to take more of fish ahead of uh, any other, other meats. Uh, those are, uh, uh, for example, the first one, uh, fish. Our customers should know that uh, the, our fish prevents uh, heart diseases. It's, it's proven. 
and uh, it's something we should to always be trumpeting about. Uh, low fat source of protein. Uh, we also talk of uh, omega fatty three acids, which are so good in in kids, especially weight control. Uh, I mean, this uh, uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, uh, we should take advantage of uh, that gap and uh, ensure that uh, as customers are. Uh, uh, trying to make sure that they lose weight to to inoculate themselves themselves against this deadly pandemic, they should consider uh, fish ahead of in other meats. Um, the issue of uh, the vitamin B12, it's also uh, uh, fish is high in that, and it's, it's something which 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 customers should uh, know and um, uh, should actually consider buying fish for. Uh, I don't have anything else to add on to this comes to my to the end of my presentation. I hope I've covered all uh, everything to do with um, uh, margin analysis and, and fish markets. Thank you so much. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Victor, uh, for the great presentation. And we uh, have learned that fish farming is, is really lucrative and uh, that's very very important especially when making uh, business decisions so thank you for the great presentation uh, our youtube channel so thank you very much thank you all and have a great day so we'll end the meeting in in less than a minute to to allow you to access the links thank you